Welcome. Before we dive into new ways of working in government enabled by technology, we need to have a basic understanding of some of the technologies that make these methods possible. Thus, in this module, we introduce you to five key new technologies, namely big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, collective intelligence, and blockchain. We're going both to define what these technologies are and how you can use them to solve public problems. Given the short time frame we have, we won't be able to go into all the ethical risks of these new technologies. However, we will point you to further resources and readings to learn more. We hope that by the end of this module, you will be able, first, to describe five key technologies for solving public problems. Second, describe specific examples of how public officials are using these technologies to deliver better solutions to public problems. And now, let's get started. First, we're going to consider big data. Big data refers to extremely large data sets that are too big to be stored or processed using traditional means. Today, new collection, storage, transmission, visualization, and analytic technologies have triggered a massive proliferation of data sets collected by public and private entities about everything from health and wellness to phone and purchase records. This data is powerful raw material for problem solving and the creation of tools that can further the public interest. So what makes data big data? First, big data reflects increasing data volume. There's an ever-increasing quantity of data being generated. In 2015, 12 zettabytes, that's 12 times 10 to the 21st of data, was created worldwide. That number is forecast to reach 163 zettabytes in 2025. Just for comparison, the entirety of the Library of Congress is only 15 terabytes, and it takes a billion terabytes to get to just one zettabyte. Second, we're accelerating data velocity the speed at which data is generated, analyzed, and utilized. Today, data is generated in near real time, whether it's human-generated data like point-of-sale credit card sales data and social media interaction data, or machine-generated data like RFID tags and sensor data. People are interacting thousands of times a day with data collecting sensors and devices. Third, big data is accumulating data variety. Data comes in a wide variety of formats, including numeric, text, images, voice, and video, among others. Data can be structured data, that is to say data can be pre-organized in traditional databases, such as fields for phone numbers and zip codes and credit card numbers. Alternatively, more and more of this data is unstructured data, data that does not come pre-organized in traditional spreadsheet-style format. According to some estimates, unstructured data accounts for more than 95% of all data that is generated today. Yet with unstructured data, contemporary analytical methods make it possible to search, to sort, and spot patterns, even without a predefined idea of what to look for. The volume, velocity, and variety of big data are making it more feasible and valuable for improving how we govern. By analyzing data that government generates, collects, and shares, policymakers can understand past performance of public policies and services, evaluating both their efficiency and how they impact different populations. Let's take an example. Economists Raj Chetty, Nathaniel Hendren, and Lawrence Katz studied 20 years of income records from families that move neighborhoods using the Housing Choice Voucher Program. By analyzing that data, they discovered that the families that used Housing Choice vouchers to relocate earned significantly higher incomes, attained more education, and were less likely to become single parents when compared to their peers who stayed in their original neighborhoods. Citing this research, the Department of Housing and Urban Development overhauled the formula that it had been using for four decades to calculate rental assistance and increased opportunities for families to move to low poverty areas from high poverty areas. Larger quantities of data also enable the delivery of more tailored interventions in the present by helping governments at every level match people to the benefits for which they're entitled or the assistance of which they are in need. Let's take an example. Louisiana's Department of Health uses Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program Enrollment Data, or SNAP data, to sign people up for health benefits. Out of nearly 900,000 SNAP recipients, Louisiana has proactively enrolled 105,000 people in Medicaid without a separate application process. 
Instead, they're using a four-question yes or no survey. This approach has helped some of the state's poorest residents get access to the benefits for which they are entitled, while also saving the state approximately $1.5 million in administrative costs. Better access to data even helps with forecasting future outcomes, such as predicting who is likely to be a frequent visitor to the emergency room, thereby enabling more targeted interventions and treatment. Having access to data and predictive models can help governments to prevent and deal with outbreaks and stem the spread of pandemics by answering questions like, how many people will a disease potentially infect? How far and how quickly will the disease spread? What areas and people are at highest risk and when are they most at risk? Indeed, big data is becoming an invaluable tool in determining which of our policies and services are working and for whom. Investing in policies, programs, and services that work can have a dramatic impact on real people's lives. This is why, in a rare moment of bipartisanship in 2016, Congress passed and the President signed a bill creating the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, calling for greater use of data to evaluate the efficacy of government programs. Okay, now let's take a look at artificial intelligence, or AI, one of the key tools for quickly processing vast quantities of big data that can provide data-driven insights to address public needs. AI can generally be defined as the programming of a computer to make decisions and learn and perform tasks that are typically reserved for human intelligence. Examples of these tasks include the ability to understand and monitor visual and auditory information, to reason, to make predictions, to interact with humans and machines, and continuously learn and improve. This technology enables machines to enhance and to automate the work that is today done by humans. For example, Netflix and Spotify algorithms, those that recommend what movie to watch or what song to listen to, those are powered by AI. The more you use them, the smarter they become. There are at least four AI capabilities relevant for governing. First, AI can help policymakers make predictions in ways that are more comprehensive and less subject to human bias. For example, in New York City, the Firecast project leverages AI to analyze data from across the city government to help the fire department identify buildings with the highest fire risks. Second is the detection of patterns and the ability to spot outliers. For example, AI can support policymakers to identify tax evaders or spot corruption by identifying abnormal financial activities or trends. The third capability for AI is computer vision. AI allows the collection, processing, and analysis of information from digital images and videos. For example, the United States Postal Service uses machine vision methods to recognize handwriting on envelopes and then automatically route letters. Fourth is the natural language processing capability of AI, which is essentially the digital interpretation of spoken or written language. For example, the Australian government uses a virtual assistant called Alex to field general inquiries from the public about taxation. Alex can understand a normally, conversationally phrased question and direct people then to online resources that can assist them, reducing the demand on call centers to answer basic inquiries. As a result of implementing this same technology, Australia's Intellectual Property Agency has reduced calls from 12,000 per month to 5,000 per month using the same Alex software. Okay, now let's take a look at machine learning. Machine learning is really a subset of AI. It is the science of teaching computers to learn. It's focused on creating systems that are capable of learning by themselves and is used to make processes more autonomous, efficient, and effective. It has become so popular that it is now practically synonymous with AI. Familiar devices like Siri and Alexa and Google Home are all powered by machine learning. In 2017, a research team at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh were able to train machine learning algorithm to analyze brain images and identify people with suicidal thoughts. Kansas City, Missouri, to take another example, has developed a machine learning algorithm to help predict when potholes will form on city streets. Joshua Blumenstock, a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, called a random sample of 1,000 residents culled from a database of 1.5 million mobile phone users in Rwanda. His team used what they learned from the phone survey to then develop and train a machine learning model to predict wealth, 
and applied it then back to the complete calling data from those one and a half million users to create a detailed map of wealth and poverty levels across the whole country. When map to his model very closely approximated the government's national demographic and health study that had previously been created through manual surveys. However, Blumenstock's approach achieved those results in 10 times the speed and 50 times cheaper, paving the way to apply machine learning methods to accelerate demographic research. Okay, fourth on our list of technologies is the category of tools known as collective intelligence. Although it receives less attention than AI, collective intelligence describes how groups of people and machines assemble in ways that lead to advances in intelligence. Let's start with an example. Since being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 14, Dana Lewis had to tolerate the lack of innovation by conventional medical device firms. When her dissatisfaction finally boiled over in 2013, she created an artificial do-it-yourself insulin system that administers the right amount of insulin automatically. Later, she decided to make the technology available to all those with the illness who were willing to build their own system. The resulting internet community now has 400 so-called DIY diabetics who share readings online and collaboratively improve the device over time. Just as members of the public contribute to writing Wikipedia entries or restaurant reviews on Yelp, they can and will share their collective intelligence to solve public problems. New technologies are making it even easier to tap into the expertise and intelligence of the crowd to add legitimacy and effectiveness to policies and service delivery. In a world where technology allows for global collaboration, there are few barriers to getting the right people together to work on some of our most pressing problems. Risk Map is a great example of collective intelligence. As hurricane season batters the East Coast of the United States, Risk Map helps residents and government officials track flooding in Broward County, Florida. Residents affected by flooding can add information to a publicly available map via popular social media channels. Officials can then assess damage and reroute traffic. Risk Map aggregates flooding reports from thousands of individuals and uses them to create a real time map of flooding to aid in relief efforts in Indonesia, in India, and in Florida for millions of people. Of course, there are risks associated with disseminating information in such a manner, but let's save those risks for a later discussion and our reading. Finally, the last technology we will explore is blockchain. Blockchain is what is known as a distributed ledger technology that can make it possible to store user identity and transaction information both more securely and more openly. With this technology, a single database is replaced by a large number of identical databases, each hosted and maintained by a different party. When changes are entered in one copy, all the other copies are simultaneously changed, making discrepancies transparent and enabling changes to be tracked to their source. In government, blockchain is being used for projects that address regulatory compliance, contract management, identity management, and records management. It offers a secure, inexpensive, and most important, transparent method of conducting several government and personal affairs. For example, because blockchain makes it transparent when records are changed, it's really useful for projects requiring individuals to authenticate their identity online. The 2016 Massachusetts Democratic State Convention, for example, used a blockchain-based app called VOATS, or VOATS, V-O-A-T-Z, to create a more secure voting platform. Blockchain also makes it possible to see changes in records, which is why it has become so popular for use with land registries. WiseKey and Microsoft, two firms, are working together to provide the Rwandan government with blockchain platforms that support identity verification practices, especially as they relate to the management of national land registry systems. The Illinois Blockchain Initiative, a collaborative effort among a number of state and county agencies in Illinois, in Illinois, is piloting the use of blockchain to make it possible for a citizen to share his or her birth records with multiple entities seamlessly and safely. In its blockchain-based birth registration system, once a birth is verified, the record is then stored in the blockchain and can be shared with businesses and government institutions via encrypted access simplifying the process of applying, for example, for a driver's license or a bank account. 
Ukrainian land registry is using a blockchain system application that protects auctions from black market controls and instead offers ways even, uh, to even out the land price slide and increase income for farmers. Blockchain also enables what are known as self-executing contracts, also known as smart contracts, where the software automatically executes the transaction, such as selling or buying, when the conditions are met in the contract without the need for human intervention, thereby decreasing opportunities for fraud or for bribery. Okay, that concludes our whirlwind introduction to some of the new technologies being used by governments around the world to improve public services and solve public problems. As we've seen, the rapid growth in data, combined with the use of technology to aggregate and analyze data in new ways, opens up numerous opportunities for governments to be more efficient, be more responsive to residents' needs, and plan for the future more effectively. To further explore some of the technologies and concepts we've discussed today, make sure to check out the readings associated with this module. Also, we encourage you to do your own research as well. There's a plethora of content out there on the technologies we have discussed. So keep exploring. Thank you.